talk a little bit about the space that we're in tonight. So we are at Impact Hub Baltimore. It is a co-working space. So you can actually get a membership here and work here if you really enjoy the space. They have um, pretty affordable student memberships. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can do that. There are also a lot of social impact and social entrepreneurial businesses that have offices here. Um, upstairs is the James Hood Michael Film Center. There's other nonprofits in this building, the Baltimore Jewelry Center is here. So it's a really cool building. Um, if you haven't been here before, uh, if you have been here before, welcome back. Um, Impact Hub is a great space uh, for events as well, and they really are very community oriented. They opened in 2015, um, and College Town has been um, members here. We've had our offices here in the summers, and they host really great events. They also have the um, Baltimore Red Line exhibit that's up, so if you haven't had a chance to read through that, it starts in that corner and works the way you're around the, around the room. Um, I know I've walked a couple of folks to the restrooms. If you need help finding the restrooms, we're happy to, to show you where they are. It is a little bit of a maze. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it, hand it over to Brett, who's going to lead our panel tonight. So think of some good questions. Um, these folks would not give up their Thursday evening for just anybody. They want to talk to students, so they want to get to know you um, and answer your questions about the finance industry, which is very broad. So we have lots of good representation from lots of different orgs, and I'll hand it over to Brett. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, appreciate the uh, honor to be here tonight. It's uh, former, I've uh, been associated with the Baltimore College Town Network for many many, many years. I was in higher education for uh, 20 years before I got into banking. Um, uh, it was a Hopkins grad, so uh, I've been in Baltimore for uh, most of most of my adult life and, and into my early college years. So it's a great organization and I really appreciate Chris and team for, uh, for all you do. So it's a great organization. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's uh, great to see all of you have an interest and in, in willing to learn and Listen to network, and that's the kind of first step to kind of get the career moving is, is doing what you're doing tonight. There's these random clothes that right bring folks together that don't know each other and, and uh, really get to know each other. But uh, my name is Brett Schreiber, I'm uh, Vice President for Life Sciences and Technology at Fulton Bank. Um, Fulton Bank, we're a, a $28 billion financial institution based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was founded over 145 years ago and has spread through five states, and Maryland being one of them. Uh, life science technology, like well, life science and tech. What, what, what do you mean, life science and tech? So we support uh, early stage life science and technology companies. These are companies that develop vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, medical devices, health IT, and tech being your innovators, entrepreneurs. Anything that you know, building a better mousetrap uses innovation to scale. These are your, you know, your the, the wild ideas that you're going to see that are the next massive companies that you're going to see built and the technologies that you can only dream of. Uh, what we do is we provide very early stage money to help them get started. So these are companies that, that their founders have a really great idea and they need help trying to get to that next stage. Like, I've got a great idea. Uh, I want to build this medical device that you breathe into and it gives you 10 different uh, diagnostics to kind of show you what's going on. But I need money to get to the stage, to, to build out the device, to sell the device, to hire staff. And so what we do is we try to figure out how to help companies do that. So uh, we've been doing that for two years. We've been able to help already in a two-year time frame about 120 different companies. And uh, you know, a lot of our companies are starting to scale and grow right now because of the, the, the dollars that we can get from the early stage. So um, should I just kind of pass the mic down and introduce the, the panel and introduce the rest themselves? Or if you've got a strong enough voice, feel free to speak up. Yeah, sure. Hey, guys. So my name is Jared Richard. Uh, I'm a company called T. Rowe Price. My official title is called uh, Associate Analyst. So I work under a portfolio manager. Uh, other associate analysts will work under an uh, investment analyst who primarily look at stocks. Uh, and basically, I'm almost like an apprentice to that person. So they're, I'm taking a role in their process and learning along the way to potentially become my, a stock analyst myself. And I work in the metals and mining space primarily. And the firm T. Rowe Price, so that's a big premier uh, investment firm that's headquartered in Baltimore. There aren't too many that are headquartered in Baltimore, so that's pretty significant for that firm. We primarily do retirement services as well as uh, personal, like uh, large, I guess, wealthy individuals will manage their funds. And then um, also we will manage institutional money as well. So it's, it's pretty big. We, we manage about 1.7 trillion. And we're one of the like, biggest, what you 
we call active managers, who primarily are business stock picking from a bottom up perspective. So we'll look into companies, talk to the management teams, um, follow the 10Ks, 10Qs, uh, all the earnings of these companies, and just learn about the company to basically get insight into whether or not we should buy or sell that individual stock. And across the platform, there are pretty much an entire research platform, which is embedded well in just about every industry. And then alongside that, we're also, we also have a fixed income side, so they, they handle debt, as well as multi-asset portfolios, which are essentially a combination of assets, including derivatives, which would be like, um, like calls and put, put options. So, yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Huggins, and I'm senior Stephanie <laughs> um, I work with, for Morgan Stanley, I'm a director in legal and compliance. Um, I'm kind of on the side of banking that you don't hear about a lot. Um, it's We work in the background um, when you open an account and we kind of review you as a client, we review your business, and we're taking a look at, you know, where's your money coming from? Um, how are you, like, are you in the marijuana business? Are you in the gaming business? Um, all of these regulated um, fields that maybe we should or shouldn't be able to do business with. Um, you know, after 9-11, there are a lot of regulations that went into place, and um, you see a lot of banks in trouble, you know, these days for doing business with folks that they shouldn't be doing business with or, you know, mismanaging funds. So we're in the background making sure that all of that is being handled properly um, within the proper guidelines. We also handle investigations. Um, if we see some things going on in accounts or you appear to be in a client that Maybe we should or shouldn't be doing business with, um, you know, one that pops in my mind if you're, they call them PEPs, like politically exposed person. So we're going to look into those folks a little bit more and see where their money is coming from. Um, if we have transactions that aren't looking quite right, you know, we take a look at what's going on there. We look at negative news. If your name pops up in the news, we're looking at what's going on with you and maybe we need to sabotage. A big one right now um, is... Of course, everybody knows what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Um, we handle sanctions. So if we're no longer supposed to do business with this country, you know, we have to take a look at what clients touch that country and um, shut those accounts down. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Like, so it's really a great field if you are somebody who's really analytical, likes to kind of dig in, put together the puzzle. Um, if you're that friend that everybody goes to, if you want to get all that information out, somebody goes digging on social media and investigating, you know, it's a really, it's a really good field to get into. I got into it totally um, by accident. You know, I started out in retail banking, you know, working with investments and things like that. And um, I got an offer for a job about compliance. I'm like, what's that? You know. <laughs> Um, Don't steal our questions. Moving <laughs> in the question. Of okay. But yeah, so <laughs> moving on. But um, yeah, it's a really great thing, to, and we'll talk about it a little more. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Webb. I work at Brown Advisory. We're a private firm. Uh, we have an office located in Bells Point. Uh, we have about 13 offices globally, but we are asset management. We have both private clients, which are individuals, families, um, organizations, which falls under our ENF endowments and foundations umbrella. And then we also have institutional clients, which is primarily our single strategy investors. Um, our firm has both our internal research arms, which are in fixed income as well as equity. We also do alternatives investment as well as um, external manager research, especially for our private clients. Uh, we are, I've been at the firm 10 years, I'm a business analyst, so in all of that, my role specifically is around investment risk, um, so I don't work directly with clients, I'm kind of behind the scenes after all the decisions have been made, and do a lot of um, monitoring of those investments as they change, as some of our portfolio managers, as well as the client portfolio managers make decisions over time and then monitor kind of forward-looking market risk, credit risk, different risks that are rising in the market. Well, excellent. Well, thank you all for, for the introductions. I think, so what we're going to do now is, uh, and you can keep, uh, do, do I need to, to get that in there? Okay. Why don't you all keep it, and uh, hopefully my voice can carry, and you can just share the mic back and forth if you need it. So we're going to uh, just get into some questions, and then we'll save some time for some question and answer at the end. So 
Well, let me let me start, um, Jared, since you got the mic here. Um, you know, talk about you know what what really got you into T Row. Like, what made you want to go to T Row Price and work? What attracted you to the role? And then, second part of the question is, you know. Is that what you did at college? I mean, I can guarantee for me, it was definitely not what I studied in college. Absolutely not, not even close. I'm getting to that in a little bit, but but it just shows you all that, you know, just what you start now might not be where you end up, and that's fine, right? Because, because that's the thing about education and life, it's a, it's a constant lifelong learning. And you learn along the way the different pathways, and what you study now could be a base for what you do later, which it did, which it did for me. But, but Jared, let's start with you. You know, what what what, what tracked you to T-Row, and what you do in college? That, did it help it did lead to this? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm actually, I'm a local Marylander, so I grew up about 40 minutes north of the city in a little town called Boston. Oh, I, I, I live in Jerseyville. Oh, Boston. <laughs> small, small town. Yeah. We're literally like, my daughter goes to Boston High School. Did you go to Boston? Yeah, I did. Oh, super small world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so I went to UMBC as well for my undergrad. And I studied computer science, actually, so I knew nothing about finance. I never took any finance classes in high school, um, but what got me interested is actually talking to a couple, um, I guess, mentors in my life who, when I basically talked to them about computer science, when I was doing it, I basically, I wasn't really that passionate about it, right? It wasn't something that excited me, it was more just, I thought of it as kind of like a safety net, it was a good job, you can basically get like a 80K salary, and there's many jobs, and I was looking like, okay, how could I apply my computer science to something else. And that's something else that ended up becoming finance when I did an internship first with T. Rowe Price on their trading desk. And that's really when I started to get more interested in finance. And I was, did well, and I really liked it. And I ended up coming back to what's called the Investment Fellowship Program at T. Rowe Price, which is kind of like a big internship program that will help you figure out what you want to do if you don't know. Uh, it combines finance, statistics, mathematics, computer science all together into um, one program where you're actually not staying on a team, but you're, every six months you're rotating teams for up to two years. And at any point during those two years, you can apply internally or externally, but, but usually internally, um, for a role within the company. So I started out as an investment fellow, uh, learned a bit of finance, and ended up doing a rotation on a more fundamental uh, finance team. And that's where I was like, all right, I don't know if I, I don't really want to do any of the quantitative stuff anymore. I just want to focus more on the bottoms of research, um, probably core finance. And that's when I ended up switching into the associate analyst program, which is the program I'm in now. Um, so yeah, totally different than computer science. I still use a little bit of my computer science knowledge, but it's not the core of what I do anymore. Um, Ashley or Stephanie, whoever's got the, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, as far as how I got into Morgan Stanley, um, it's actually kind of what Brett was saying, you know, it was, you know, I was out at, looking at you know, different job descriptions and I saw this job pop up at Morgan Stanley. It was kind of like a piece of every job that I had done previously. And I'm like, wow, this would really be a great fit. I was actually working at Super Price at the time. Um, and I applied and, you know, got the job and, that's what I learned about, you know, I had worked in compliance before, but, um, you know, learned, there's a whole lot going on that you know, I never had thought of. I started, started out as actually a physical therapy major at UMBC um, and then switched to econ. So it, it's pretty in line with what my, um, my degree is in. Um, however, you know, with, with the computer science degree, it probably would be really helpful for specifically what I do now um, because I work in, it's like IT somewhat, um, we do a lot of the testing of the systems that do the monitoring. Um, so it's finance, but it's also IT as well. Um, oh, uh, just what you talked about what you did in college, whether that was, yeah. you know, applicable to, you know, where you started and then just what got you the role. So you, yeah, you, so, you, yeah, pretty much I covered it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, Ashley? Sure. Um, so I was a math major in college and knew I wanted to go into finance, but wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. Um, I think some of the attributes that go into math are you like numbers, you like trying to make numbers make sense and tell stories and model things. 
Um, and so I knew I wanted to be in finance. I did not start in my current role directly out of college. I actually worked at a, um, it was kind of a, I want to say a marketing firm, but I was a data analyst there. Um, and so I did that. Actually, I did love it. It was a lot of fun, but I still wanted to get back to finance. And so um, I worked at another larger uh, company, which was great, but then I was looking for roles that would get me closer to that data and doing more analytics, doing more forecasting, doing more analysis. Um, and so in the little, I guess, Fells Point corridor, I was familiar um, and run into some folks that were at this firm and was looking at different opportunities um, and I was noticing where I was, a lot of the opportunities I was interested in would have taken me um, to New York, which will lead to the next question on the roof. Um, and so I wanted to exhaust the options, not because I didn't want to go, but just kind of dig more into what's in Baltimore. And so I came across Brown Advisory. They had a great role opening, um, and they were growing very quickly. So this opportunity is also, I started in a different role and transitioned as the firm started formulating this, this formal program of um, investment risk. Uh, and so that's how it lined me up with where I wanted to be. So it was a great opportunity that sort of, I don't want to say fell in my lap because even if it falls in your lap, you still have to take it. Um, but uh, it sort of came about over time. Um, and yes, I would say what I'm doing now relates to what I studied. I went on and did a, a master's in, in math finance, so add it to the to the books, I guess. So everybody, if you love math, go for it. <laughs> well, you can go ahead and keep the uh, thing. I'm going to uh, take a moderator's prerogative here and talk a little bit about uh, what we about what Full Bank too, because it's a non-traditional round. I think it's important for you all to understand uh, the, the non-traditional round. So I was a uh, a uh, political science major at Johns Hopkins University. I had a fascination with politics and wanted to go into politics, and it was a great background. And, and uh, you know, got a uh, internship right out of college with a lobbying firm in Annapolis, and eventually became the lobbyist for Johns Hopkins. And then, a, and then a decade after that, a group called the Maryland Independent College University Association represented well, a lot of the college town institutions: North Carolina, Maryland University, MICA, Johns Hopkins. Uh, Goucher and a bunch of colleges, and, and I would advocate for money for scholarships and financial aid and buildings. Do you have any Hopkins students here, all right? Just out of curiosity, Gilman Hall, you know Gilman Hall, right? So, for example, one of the things I did is I got six million dollars from the state for renovation of Gilman Hall. Now, that took place many years ago, but you know, thank the Maryland taxpayers for that. But it's my job to, to do that. Um, and so, uh, so I did that for 20 years. and. Got to know, you know, when you're in politics, you get to know a lot of different folks. You create, make a lot of different connections. And when Governor Hogan got elected, he brought in a gentleman named Mike Gill to be the Secretary of Commerce. Um, and uh, and because I work with the colleges, and, and when you're lobbying for money now, but you work along with your 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 uh, sister institutions at the community colleges and the University of Maryland and Taos and the like, and I got to know all those colleges because we always work together on behalf of each other in Annapolis and the Secretary. Came in and he was starting a new office at the state of Maryland called the Office of Education and Innovation. It was like the first of its kind that, that worked with colleges and universities as economic development engines and worked with innovators, entrepreneurs, and startups. And so I did that office, work, uh, started that office for the state. And eventually that led me to, to lead what was called the Office of Biohealth and Life Sciences, which worked to build out the life science ecosystem in the state of Maryland. And doing that, you know, you got to know government, you got to know work with companies, you got to work with higher education institutions. And eventually, Fulton Bank came along, and they were looking to, to move into the city of Baltimore and help companies in the life science and tech space. And uh, the more we started talking at my role in terms of helping them from the state move into the state of Maryland, they, they realized that I knew a lot of companies in the space. And so, uh, you know, one of the other aspects that, that's different from the panel in terms of what we do is, you know, we give money to companies to help them. And so, from a non-traditional route, you know, the fact that we, I knew a lot of companies enabled me to get out there and figure out which companies really needed the most support and how to help it. And so I went from being a lobbyist to working for the state of Maryland to, to a banker over a 20 year period, but you know, never thought and in, in, in all likely when I was a student college I would ever be in banking. But every day I'm working with companies trying to figure out, you know, what do you need to get that next step? How can we help you? And so it's 
it's almost like a, it's a, it, it's a different way of thinking of finance than you all think about. It's almost like a, you know, for me, I work with the I still work with the state, I work with the city to, you know, from an economic development perspective. They'll call me and say, Brett, we're trying to bring a company in the city. You know, we need some help. We need to give them some money to so that they'll come and locate here in, in Maryland and in Baltimore and grow. And so I'm working with these agencies from an economic development perspective. So it's a, but again, started out as a political science maker. Never thought I'd be here in, in finance. Never studied finance. In fact, to, to get into it, I had to, you know, I'm like learning organically. Like still to this day, my boss and people say something. I was like, I don't know what the hell you're saying. I'm Googling in the background what it means. So, so you can get into this from a non-traditional way, and, and and your finance background can take you in a non-traditional way. So. Anyway, just wanted to take the moderator prerogative to jump in on that. But um, so um, let's start with that. Uh, actually, since you have the uh, microphone here, um, you know, one, one of the common misperceptions is everyone thinks of, uh, you know, when, when you think of Baltimore, you don't necessarily think of finance, right? You don't necessarily think that this is the center of finance. You think of where? Where do you think of when you, when you think of finance? What, what city comes to mind? New York. New York, right? You think of New York. but. But you know, Baltimore, we've got a thriving financial industry here. Um, so you know, let's start actually. What you know about what you know? What are some of the um, opportunities that Baltimore offers? You know, why is this a, a center? For, why can't why can't this be a center for finance? And and what you know, we could probably be even more so. But what are some of the opportunities here in Baltimore that that, that students here should be thinking of this as a place for finance and fin the financial industry? Yeah, I think um, Baltimore certainly can be a center. For finance and, and finance is an industry and I think it exists in pockets it's just not wide enough known um, but I, I do think that um, it's also growing if you think about some of the new construction that's come in and the offices are getting bigger and hiring is going up um, so it, it's certainly what I think I've enjoyed about being in Baltimore and I think I'm you know, my firm has an office in New York, so I do occasionally get to visit and, and live, you know, a day of New York lifestyle. I don't know if that, that's really a thing, but it's it's nice. And I, I do enjoy New York City. I think it's great. Um, but I think what I've, I've benefited and enjoyed about Baltimore is a little bit that it is small and that you get to connect with a lot of folks. Like, these are familiar company names. They're familiar company names in general, but I feel like you get to connect with folks on a personal level and do events and co-events. Um, nothing against large companies, uh, but I think it's it's created a more in, intimate environment um, and an ability to share knowledge, connect, make friends, um, share information. Uh, so I, I mean, I think it's 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 in a pocket. There is a big finance industry in Baltimore. I just think it's. It's a bit more intimate. It's growing, um, but there's a lot of exciting opportunity that you can find anywhere. Great. And and then the second part, I think you did answer. How has your career benefited from being in Baltimore? I think it, I think you touched on that a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. I would. I would. Um, you know, one of the things Kirsten and I uh, connected through um, business volunteers, who does a give fellowship program, um, which gets you more engaged in the community. And that program specifically does a great job of kind of getting um, uh, individuals, professionals from different companies together, which helps to build that network. And I think um, it speaks to how connected some of the organizations, companies in Baltimore, whether it's finance or not finance, um, tend to work together or collaborate on different things to make it feel lend to that intimate, intimate environment. Um, and it's it's grown my network, I think, naturally. So I'm terrible at networking. When I see networking, I'm like, oh my gosh, put me in a quarter so I can cry. Uh, but I do enjoy talking to people. Um, and so networking has gotten much more nat natural for me uh, because it's, it's helped me connect with people. And it's a bit smaller, intimate events like this um, that give you the chance to get, know, get to know others, share information, connect, and just kind of keep building um, that environment. So I think it, it lends both on the professional side and also on your personal side. Great. Go ahead, um, Stephanie. Um, okay. So yeah, I was actually born and raised in New York, so I really had that narrow view of New York as like the center of finance. So. Um, 
you know, I was really surprised at how much finance, um, you know, was going on here in Baltimore. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here and a lot of companies are moving their jobs here just because of economics. You know, it's real estate is a lot cheaper here. Um, so a lot of our New York jobs with Morgan Stanley are coming down here. Um, they're moving like a lot of the operations jobs down here because it's number one, real estate is cheaper. And number two, you know, the cost of living is cheaper. So therefore, you know, employment, you know, paying your employees is a lot cheaper. Um, so there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity here. Um, we have a lot of banks here. We have local banks here. You know, we have MT, Harbor Bank. Um, so there, there's a ton of opportunity here. And um, the other part of the question, you know, about how my career has benefited, I, I would, you know, piggyback off what Ashley was saying about being able to network, but I would say, um, you know, internally within your company, working in a smaller pocket of a larger firm allows you to get recognized. Um, you know, my boss sits about 10 feet away from me here in New York. You know, there's like a ton of people. You, you may not even know the person you report to. You, you may not see your boss. They're probably in an office on a different floor. So, you know, so you're a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, here in Baltimore, you know, it's you have the opportunity to network, you know, with others and within your company. Um, get involved with your company and get your name out there. And it helps you grow your career. Um, in a, in a, a smaller environment you know you may want to go to that new york office but it gives you a chance within that smaller environment to grow and develop your skills um you know without feeling too overwhelmed Eric, same question sure yeah i might have a little bit less context on this one because i mean i started to about two years ago so i'm not as familiar with i guess the uh, other firms in, in baltimore outside of t-row but i know for t-row I and mean, one of the things that is very distinct about it is a lot of employees say that there's a much better work-life balance in T-Row in comparison to a lot of the New York firms where, I mean, in finance, you're always working, you're going to be working very hard. Um, that's just part of the industry, right? But in New York, it might be 80 hour weeks on average. And T-Row, maybe it's more like 60 hour weeks on average, right? So it's still better. Um, the other piece of it is, I think, uh, on the personal finance perspective, kind of like what Stephanie said, right? There is a lower cost of living in Baltimore. So uh, if you make a similar salary in comparison to somebody in New York, after your expenses, you're probably gonna have a little bit more fluff, right? More, you can invest personally or you can do more fun things. But uh, the other piece of it for me that was pretty big was when I was coming out of college, I don't know if I would have been ready to really make a jump to New York and like go crazy or like not go crazy, but just, I take that step of leaving where I'm more comfortable, right? And I'd probably be able to be willing to do that now after like being a little bit more in my career. But I think then it probably would have been more daunting to me and less appealing to take on a job like the one I have if I had to leave my family and all my friends and go into another state, right? So many of you guys who are local to Baltimore, you have connections and ties here, right? you should definitely take into consideration that there are really good finance opportunities in the city that you can look into, um, if, if that's something that's important to you. Excellent, you keep that going. Um, but uh, I'll jump in here too as well. So, you know, at the, at the cornerstone of finance, it's it's your, you're helping whom, right? You're helping individuals and you're helping companies, right? That's in, in, in my role, we're, we're helping companies. And, and the reason, one of the great things to think about Baltimore is that, um, you know, you know, it's it's funny. Like you, the, the the careers that that you all are in. I don't know how many. What are the average kind of age here? We've got freshmen. How many? All right, sophomores, juniors, seniors, grad. Okay, so we're, we're a little bit all over the place. But but you know, some of you that are freshmen, for example. I mean, there's going to be companies and innovations that aren't even existing today that will be jobs when you graduate. And a lot of those. Are coming out of our colleges and universities, right? They are the they're the springboards for innovation in many respects. If you go around any country in the world and you look for the most innovative societies and innovative countries, there's usually concentrated around colleges and universities, right? They're the center for thinking and learning. And so, so Maryland has some of the best colleges and universities in the nation. I mean, you know, all the, I mean, you got UMBC and Hopkins and Towson and UMB and UV. And, I mean, it's just really some incredible. Uh, some incredible colleges and universities, and, and just 
Johns Hopkins alone, you know, we're, we're, we were very close with them. They had 145 companies that sprang out from the faculty and students and ideas. And, and College Park, there's dozens. And UMB on the west side of Baltimore has something called the UMB Bio Park. There's like 20 to 30 companies that are located in there. And so for the financial industry, you know, these are the future kind of titans of, uh, of, of Baltimore, really. Um, you know, there's a company called Fearless. Uh, they're a technology company. When I was with the Maryland Department of Com uh, Commerce, Dalali Desire, I always get his last name wrong. Desire, um, something I'm, I'm killing is Theraza. Yeah. So he had he had six employees when I met him, uh, and I met with him yesterday. And they have 300 employees. That's been six years. 300 employees. And now he's and, and he's created he had 30 million dollars in revenue. He's looking to do 60 million this year, and he's looking he's moving to other states. So shortly. Uh, and I'm saying, you know, that was in a very short amount of time. You know, Fearless is going to be one of those major companies here in Baltimore, and and there's a bunch of others like that. So for 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 Baltimore uh, to be a center for finance, it, it comes around the core needs, and so we got a very uh, emerging uh, growth of companies that are coming up, and so it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a need for a very strong financial industry to surround these companies with the resources that they need. Um, and so for me, you know, how has my career benefited? I mean, you know, these colleges and universities are a hotbed of, of innovation. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it's like I represent five states, but I haven't been able to get out of Maryland yet because I get too many opportunities here in Maryland just because these companies need help. So for me, I just, I'm just working at UMBC and UMB and Hopkins and Tallis and Lowell and others. And I'm, we're getting all the companies that are more than we can even handle in terms of trying to help. I can't keep up with the amount of companies. So it's that that center of innovation that's, that's really spurring us in the financial industry. So um, let's move on uh, here with the panel. These have been great stuff. So Jared, let's start with you while you got the mic. Um, let's go back in time for you, probably not too long, a couple years. And <laughs> let me just add to that, uh, you know, in, in high school, I was at North Hartford Hall. So we were uh, competitors in, in, in high school. In fact, my daughter's now a cougar. I almost didn't move into my house because uh, she was going to have to go to Falls High School, which was a, the arch rival of my high school, which is crazy to think about. So it's, don't ever do that. Like, get way bad, bad, but but anyway, it's really funny that we're kind of uh, it's a small world. But a couple couple years back, right? How, how long you out of college? Two, two years out of college. Um, you know, if you go go back just two years <laughs> and give yourself some advice, which would be great, right? Because I'm 32, so you're going to get a, a wide range of, of thoughtful advice for our younger selves, but. Two years, what have you learned that you would have told yourself two years ago? Yeah, I mean, big thing is cast a wide net when you apply. And just because here's the thing is when you're applying to jobs, internships, whatever, right, the only active thing that you have to do is send out your resume, right? Once you do that, it's just following up. Other people, the recruiters will reach out to you, they'll set up the meetings for you. You just have to show up from that point on, right? So if you can just Get yourself to like maybe spend a Saturday and just put out your resume to 15 places. Go to that career fair, bring 10 resumes and just put them out to different recruiters, right? Once you've done that, you've pretty much done the work that you need to do, and then you can start focusing back on your college stuff. Um, and then the recruiters will just follow up with you, and then you just show up, right? It's, it's pretty simple after that point. So. And what does that do for you when you apply that? Well, one is if you get a, if you get your first offer, right? Then all of a sudden now you have like a leveraging kind of ground where you can now be more evaluating of the other opportunities that come to you. Like you don't just have to take whatever comes to you. Um, you can actually start evaluating what, what am I actually going to be doing in this finance role, and you can start comparing it to your other offers as well. And that gives you more of a I guess, dynamic approach or more of a intrinsically driven approach to what you're going to be doing for your job and your internship and gives you more control over your career. Um, because, like, as a college student, right, you don't have, if you don't have an internship or a job, right, then you're kind of like just trying to grasp whatever. But if you have lots of opportunities, if you have other, if you have a big swath of opportunities to take from, you have a lot more flexibility and control, and you have kind of a bargaining position that you can kind of that you can come from. So I didn't do that well. I just I I had maybe like one to three things that I would apply for, right? Where in hindsight I would definitely do more because then I can just be more evaluative. And it ended up working out for me, but I wouldn't say that that's true for everybody. So I 
Or better. All right, Stephanie, travel back in time. What would you tell your younger self? Um, I would say it's okay not to have it all figured out. Um, I mentioned a little earlier, I started out as whole physical therapy. Um, I got a job on campus in the finance office, so that started my career in finance. Um, I worked in retail banking. Um, I actually worked for UMBC for a number of years in the um, business services office. Um, and then I worked in, uh, I think it was like called financial advisory, which was kind of like audit. Then I ventured off, I worked with PayPal. Um, I worked at T. Rowe for a little bit, and now I'm at Morgan Stanley. Um, so, you know, I think you graduated college and I mean, I'm sorry, not college, high school, and you're starting to go to college and pick a major, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> it's it's kind of like forced upon you, and it's okay if you change your major. It, it, so, like I said, it's, it's okay to not have it figured out. Um, and the other thing I would say is, um, you know, networking is really important. Throughout all those different jobs and all those years, I was meeting people and making connections, which also helped to get me, you know, into the roles where I am today. You know, when I would interview for a new role or interview at a new company, I can reach back out to my old boss and old colleague and say, hey, can you give me some tips about this? Um, my old boss actually works with me now. Um, so it's really important with those connections. And a funny story is I used to drive Uber and I picked up this lady. She was from Morgan Stanley. Um, you know, she was like, oh, yeah, here's my card. You know, if you ever want to switch your job, I'll go kids you. You know, give me a call. Totally forgot about this, and I'm cleaning my house, you know, a couple of years ago, and I found her car, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder if she still works there. She does. So, um, you know, networking is really important. Not burning bridges is really important. You know, um, if you have a job and you're unhappy there, just leave gracefully, you know, um, don't burn those bridges. Your hardest boss is going to be your best boss. Um, my boss that gave me the hardest time was like, you know, this isn't centered properly, and you know, you need to change the thoughts on this, is the reason I'm so detail-oriented today. But in that moment, I hated it. <laughs> Sometimes I would go home and cry. But um, take every opportunity as an opportunity to learn and be better. Um, sometimes those tough times are what make us great in the end. That was great advice. Thank you. <laughs> Ashley? I'll probably date myself a little bit on this one, um, only because, so internships were still around when I was in college, <laughs> not that, um, but it was more common as a junior going into the senior year. Today, I know it still exists, but um, there's a lot of internships out there. My company has an internship program. Um, a lot of companies use that as you know, getting information. It's not just do the paperwork and do the filing anymore. It's getting into projects and learning more about what the roles do at firms. So do your research, do a lot of research, get curious. It can seem overwhelming, but stick with it. Um, I, I would have spent probably a little more time doing internship stuff uh, back then, but it's definitely a much bigger role now, and I think it can be really helpful in the long run. Because not only you may learn what you don't want to do, you may learn more about what you do want to do. Um, but you'll also build your network a bit more naturally, uh, which is more comfortable for me. So do my issues. <laughs> um, uh, and I think with all of that, the other piece is really think about what you want to do. I spent a lot of time thinking, like, I know I want to do math. I know I want to do finance. But think about the things that you enjoy about the roles that you're seeking, the aspects of those roles. Do you like a lot of projects? Do you like different things? Do you want to talk to people more? So think, as you're looking through those roles, think about things that you really like to do and can see yourself doing. It's not going to be permanent. It will change. It's perfectly fine. Um, I work with folks that came from all different majors, history majors, the whole span. So as long as you're thinking about the role you want, also think about the things that you, you like about it or that you would like to be doing. And not just a couple things too, just a small to large. Um, small, you know, do things like write a thank you note. Don't text a thank you note, write a thank you note. Take out the pen and paper and just write a thank you when you go on interviews. I remember my first job at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I, I, I actually, to this day, I know the person that uh, is in city government right now that we were competing against for the same job. And uh, I got hired, and and uh, he said, you know what, uh, you know, you, you did a good job. You probably weren't the most qualified, but you were the only one of everyone that took the time to thank me for 
for going through that interview process. And quite frankly, it meant a lot that, that you took the time, you wrote a note, and, and you, you said thank you. Um, and you know, a lot of that you know, is lost in, I think, some of the generations that are going out there, just the, the old the manners of just, you know, again, don't text it, that's easy, right? And yeah, anyone can just dictate, hey, hey, hey Matt, thank you for the interview, really appreciate it. No, write it, send it, put a stamp on it, you know, that makes a difference. Um, the other thing is, uh, if, if some of you uh, are thinking about going on beyond an undergraduate degree and getting a graduate degree, it, from my side, do it early. Um, you know, I went through, uh, and, and it worked out okay, right? I got divorced, uh, and, uh, but I had a, a little girl, a beautiful little girl, who's a graduate of Falls, and gonna, just committed to Towson, and I got remarried, and, and all that kind of worked out. But at that time, uh, I had waited several years. I thought when I graduated, I was like, my God, I'm so sick of it. I'm done. I just want to go get a job. And, you know, I went another decade or so out there in the workforce and then said, you know what, I'm going to go get my MBA. I was almost halfway through and, and went through the divorce. And then all of a sudden, I was a single father and it, I couldn't do it. It just didn't make sense. And, and, and one of my biggest regrets today, I probably couldn't actually go back to college, but I was the best like that. You know, you, you're gonna go back and get that degree now. It's like, good lord, I don't have any time to do it now. It's like, but, but so, but anyway, that life happens, right? Yeah, I didn't expect ten years later that I'd be going through that. Like at the time, it was okay I could study at night because you know I had a wife that would help take care of my daughter. But then when I'm taking care of it, like I can't do, you know, I gotta be there for her. So you know, life happens. So when you get a chance while you're young, if you want to go get that degree, get it right after school. You, you can get a job. A lot of colleges pay for you. Don't think that you know, you're financially challenged. Like, oh, I, I, there's no way I can pay for grad school. College or companies want you to be uh, have, have a higher education, so they will pay for you to go get that that advanced degree. So, you know, do it early. And then the last thing I would say is do something you love. You know, the last thing that you want to do when you get out there and get a job is to sit there on a Sunday. And I've had this at one o'clock. Going, oh my God, I'm dreading tomorrow. This will be like 12 30. I'll be start thinking about Monday. And I was like, I was chasing the money. I wasn't chasing the passion. Uh, and that's a horrible feeling because it's like you get two days on the weekend to recover for the next day. And if you're thinking about 12 30 on Sunday, like dreading Monday, like Sunday's over. Like you just lost a Sunday. So, so, but, but now I love what I do. Like I don't know it's Sunday now. It's like sweet. I got, I got, I got tomorrow. I got to get to meet with this innovator, this entrepreneur, and this thing and that. And, and it's like Sunday is like an enjoyable day. So uh, the money, if it, and you hear this a lot, like if you do something you love, the money will come, right? But if, you, if you're chasing the money to get something you, you know you hate, just and you're stuck in a job, and then you get stuck doing that job, and then you you know the worst in the world is to hate. Uh, so I used to be on vacation, and I'd be like, oh my god, I'm like 75 percent way through the vacation, and. I got 25% more to go, and oh my god, 50% now, 51%. Like, I've been doing these things in my mind. Like, I'm 51% through my vacation. And it's like, and it's like that's not the way to enjoy vacation. So, so do something you love. Figure out what it is you love and, and pursue that because it's going to make all the difference in the world. So, questions and answers. We're going to kick the questions and answers. So, um, we're going to kind of open up to the to, to, to all of you here. You know, any of us ask a question from any of us or just general, and one of us will jump in and and take a shot at it. Okay. Um, so my name is George. I'm a freshman at Stevenson. I was just wondering if y'all have any advice for people who are kind of just starting their college career and want to get their feet wet in the industry. I know it's hard when you don't have that experience or kind of taking those classes to help you in the industry, but what would you say to do? I can jump in. Right. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I will say one thing I've, I've learned because I heard somebody say it is the financial industry in Baltimore and making it bigger and more well-known, doing more of these, giving it a bigger presence. So that's something that I'll take away from this and take back to my company to, to expand on. Um, but I think uh, see what companies Stevenson probably has a connection with in Baltimore. Um, and keep an eye out for events that are happening. Talk to the, uh, I forget the office, the, your student office as well to see if there's someone that can connect you to some of those companies too and, and have your questions ready for what you might, because there could be mentoring opportunities there. 
Um, but I would say explore it that way. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Call, you know, go, if you got a career center there, call up a company and just, just trust me, like, if you call up and say, hey, I'm a student here, I thought it was like 20 minutes of your time just to learn about what you do and, and how I could get started. Like, we like to talk about ourselves at some juncture, right? And then at the end of it, go, do you have one other person that you think I could be able to talk to, right? When I was getting into to lobby, you know, I first started out and I'd be like, you know, I'd go to delegates office like, hey delegate, uh, so and so, or you know, my name's Brett Schreiber, I want a job. And they're like, uh, what experience do you have? I was like, nothing. They're like, listen, thank you. But but then someone said, Don't don't ask for a job. And say you're here to learn. So then I was like, you know, delegate so and so, my name's Brett Schreiber, I just want to learn more about what you did. And it was like, oh great. And they and I was like, hey, is there someone else I can talk to? Yeah, here, call Jim Smith over here. He's at this number, he's the lobbyist for this firm. I call it, hey, Jim Smith, my name is Brett Schreiber. I want to, hey, I'd love to learn a little bit about what you do. And eventually, after like 10, 15 of those conversations, someone said, what are you doing next year? I was like, well, this is my schedule. It's got like absolutely nothing on it for the next 30 years. <laughs> and he's like, do you mind, uh, you know, would you, would you want to work here? I was like, sure. And he's like, I don't pay anything. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh well, all right. But, but anyway, but it eventually led to something, right? So just, just do that, Get, just ask questions. You know, and then at the end, say, is there someone else I need to talk to? You know, give me a name. And that point lead to your next, I mean, that, that those series of conversations led, led me more than I so. Yeah, the other thing is you can talk to your professors as well, who are, who are like finance professors. They usually are doing Absolutely. things on the side, right? Uh, they're not usually just professors. So talk to them. And then there's all, often also like, Invest in clubs in schools or yeah, we um, have the financial management association and we do exactly that in western as a club yeah and that's pretty great yeah so like if you're if you're very interested in like you want to do that like that works or that, like that's a great way to get your feet wet and, um, there's probably some super like very passionate finance guys in that club who Will like if you're interested, they'll probably help you learn as well. Um, also, for some campuses have like those clubs sponsored as well, where they actually manage money. Uh, I don't know if that's true too many Baltimore schools, but it could be. So, so if you had your hand raised, yeah. Hello, my name is Amar. I arrived a little late, so I'm not familiar with you guys. But okay. the question is, I don't know how much was talked about finance, but I just want to know all the ins and outs of like different parts of finance because I'm currently a banker in the banking field and I look to like explore different areas of the finance field because I'm a freshman at University of Baltimore and I just want to know what, if you piggyback off what he said, what else I can do to like endure and work into the future. Like knowing the different departments in finance, although I do my own research, but just from our experience profession, I wouldn't know what you guys can say as well. We definitely want to kind of tell you all the ins and outs, but, but certainly I think just to kind of repeat what we got started is, you know, piggyback off your, your I think, you know, hit a great comment, piggyback off the professors and, and just, 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 just take one bit at a time, right? And just, just be a, just, or I like to say, just organically take it all in, right? It's look for those networks, look for those clubs. Um, you know, I, I don't know if people are allowed to do internships for zero dollars anymore nowadays. I have no idea, but but be willing to, to volunteer and and to do different types of things. Just get just get all the experience you can. Just sap it all up and just you know be up. Be, you know, sometimes you just sit and listen. I don't, when I you know again this was well, this I do this in the financial industry when I did lobbying for the first couple of years. I did. I just watched people. And I was like. I think you do a horrible job. You do a great job, but but I would be like even from the folks I thought did a horrible job, I was learning what not to do, right? And so you know I was I might have been wrong, but that was my opinion. But still, I was learning what 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 works, what doesn't work, you know, in terms of seeing you know how things are out there. And so just just try to learn as much as you can. Read books. I mean, read read books. I mean, I you know it, there's so much knowledge to be found in just picking up a good book from the library or the bookstore and just reading about it and just just educate yourself with all sorts of information that you might think is useless information, but at some juncture, it's going to be very important information. A quick, quick side story. Um, you know, uh, you're speaking about reading books. I read about Dwight Eisenhower, and one time, uh, you know, you all know he was former president and supreme commander during World War II. But after World War One, one of his jobs in the military was to go around and document the major battles of World War One. You know, go around Europe, and, and he hated that. 
absolutely hated it. It was hard. Like, he's like, this, I should be doing something much better than this. Uh, but what, when it came down to it, when he was supreme commander uh, of, of, the, uh, of the forces, you know, fighting the Nazis and stuff in World War II, uh, his knowledge of what worked, what didn't work during World War I, his knowledge of the battlefields, of a job that he hated became the most important aspect of, of his winning strategy to help win World War II. And you would have never known time that he hated it, but he was educating himself, didn't even know it. So get out there, whether you think it's worth or not, just you don't know what's going to stick and what's going to help you 20 years down the road. So just look for all those pockets of information. Just to get you back off the book to read, I have to go into the research. It's a book about the uh, city of Babylon, and just talks about like the basic fundamental of wealth, of saving, investing, yeah. and actually putting your money where it needs to be. Uh, yeah. Those are great places to get started. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, there's also like a lot of summer programs that a lot of these companies have where you can rotate through different departments and that will also give you a great perspective um, of just the different roles that there are in, in finance and just to pay back off of something Brett said earlier. It's okay if you, um, you know, just are interested in something that somebody's doing, ask, hey, can you put 15 minutes on your calendar to talk to me? So this is a test, like, you know, you can reach out to all of us. We're expecting to hear from you after. <laughs> but um, yeah, just, you know, or and just, I'm joking, but just, you know, anybody that, you know, you're interested in what they're, they're doing in their role. Um, it could be a family member or, you know, a friend's parent. Um, just say, hey, you know, do you have a quick 15 minutes to talk to, talk to me about, you know, what you do? And you never know what can come from that. Thank you. Are we doing okay with time? Or? One more question. One more question? All right. um, well, we got two. We'll, we'll squeeze two. Go ahead. You go first. You go first. Uh, Steph, you actually said that in your role, you uh, dealt with uh, technology. And that was, you didn't say that that was part of your education at all. So that just shows how much the field's changed over time. And I just wanted to know what changes have you seen and what things you think students or people entering the finance field should learn uh, the technology skills etc that you think would be valuable excel 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 <laughs> um but you know um that's kind of like basic technology but i will say you know when it comes to analytics um you know when you're looking at stock prices or you know like math problems excel is what's gonna you know get you there quickly um we like my job every day i touch excel um and just basic computer skills um, like what i do is called uat testing so it's like testing the ui which is the user interface so you know just being familiar with like even a banking mobile app you know how those things work and it's not necessarily like the programming um, but just like how they work and understanding like the look and feel so if somebody puts something in front of you, you can make that suggestion like, hey, you know, I was looking at Bank of America and, you know, how their UI functions in this. I think maybe we should make a change, you know, so it's just being really aware of the technology around you. Um, it's not like people think like I cannot fix a computer. I'm not a programmer, um, but, you know, I do tech, touch technology. Every day. So it's just really important to be familiar with like different thinking systems and, you know, like to see. Jobs will say, oh, work day, you need to be through the work day. If you have a job and you clock in and out, you touch work days, you can say you have like work day experience. So it's just being really familiar, you know, with all those different systems. More from the college staff member team. Just real quick, in the case that you do, how do you balance your work life? Like, how do you keep your work life balance? How do you keep work life balance? It's okay, let's continue on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably the most difficult thing that I do. Um, you know, I've got a, a daughter, two stepsons, and a wife. And my, my wife has a really challenging job, and we've got a challenging job. Um, you you got to make it a priority. Like, you can get sucked into, like, I could, you know, um, there'll be nice when I necessarily don't have my daughter and my wife and I are like both at work. It's like 8, 830. And we're like, hey, honey, we're going to come home at any time soon. And, but when my daughter's there, it's like I cut it off. Right. It's like I'm coming home. Uh, so it's like making those choices. It's like we realize, you know, when, when the family's together, you know, it's, it's a priority. Like yesterday, 
Uh, my daughter just got accepted into college, and and we, I cut work off at 4:30. I'm like, we're going to the house. We're going to buy some house and swag. We get a picture in front of this tiger, and then we go out to eat somewhere on campus so you can experience, experience life. And so, uh, you know, experience what's going on at, at college. And you know, I was in the middle of the week, and and my wife's like, I got a meeting. I was like, yeah, you're gonna have to cut it off, and just you're just gonna have to say no, right? So it's tough though because you're gonna have bosses um, that are gonna tell you differently, and 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 that's the toughest thing when you're young. You got a boss is telling you something, but if you kind of stand up, which is tough to do. But I remember making those choices early on. Like you got to stand up and say, "Hey, this is this is what I'm going to make a priority." And you make them early on. You be very transparent about it. Uh, that my priority is this. If it's not good enough, then I'm going to look elsewhere because there's a lot of choices out there. Um, and so. Uh, now, if you want to do, you know, 80, 90, whatever hours a week, that's fine. That's your choice, right? But if it, it, it depends on what you, what you want to do. But you've got to be disciplined and you've got to make it a priority. And it, it's hard. It's hard to do when you're young. And you got a boss that's demanding stuff. And, uh, you know, I had both ways where I let the boss kind of take advantage of me. And then I made it. I was like, this is not going to work. And then I made it known. And, and they were okay with it. Uh, or you move on. I moved on. And, like, too, I remember when I was uh, going through the divorce, um, you know, it was, it was tough. And, and my boss said, listen, you got to get over this already. I'm sitting there going, I know what I'm over with. It's his job. And I moved on. <laughs> because I was like, I can't believe that, that I had someone that would say, you know, I had to make a choice between work and family. You know, I was just, I was losing my daughter. And, and not, you know, 50% was still me. But not having 100%, my boss or 50%, I would never get that time back in my life. And, and the fact that I had a boss tell me that, I was like, you know what? It may be a financial hit, but I am going elsewhere. And that next job, I was like, I am a single father, and this is it. And you're like, great, we'll take it. And, and it's been great ever since. And so you just got to set that priority and, and make those expectations and be transparent. Most, not all, but most bosses will be okay if you are honest up front. Don't, don't try to hide and be better. It's, it's going to be tough. I, mean, I think the other thing I would say is it's like when you're young in this field too you might not want a much of a work-life balance because i mean i think when it comes to being older and you have family it's like absolutely you definitely do but i think when you first start out your goal is to get good at what you do as fast as you can and the only way that you get good at it is by putting in time like there is work and you want to be able to one you can build your work ethic because if you can do the work then somebody that your average person could do in eight hours you can do it in four hours or three hours right that's efficiency um you want to get really good at your at whatever you're doing in the sense that it become you can do what it used to take you 20 hours in four right and the only way that, like the only way to do that is to really put in that time. So when you're young and you don't have responsibilities, you, you don't have a family per se, right? If that's something that you want. Um, in order to really compete in this industry, that's almost a necessity because of how competitive it is, right? You have people in this industry who will who just have a, who started working 80 hours a week and then that is their entire life until they're 50, right? And they're like insane individuals, right? Like in, in their ability to to, I guess, put out results and like be really good at their work. Um, and, but that's sort of like the environment that you're competing in as well, and you need to be relevant in that environment. So I think when you're young, you kind of do want to find one, you want to find a mentor who is invested in you getting really good at what you're doing. Um, and invested in teaching you. Like for, in, in the right relationship there is that, um, you are aiding, you are assisting them. So for you to be better actually makes their life easier, which is probably the best, I guess, dynamic you want to find. Um, but I think that, yeah, from the work-life balance perspective, when you're young in finance, if that's what you want to do, you should put in, you want to put in hours early. To get a two-year perspective and 25 years perspective. <laughs> 25 years out, what are the priorities versus two years? So it's, you're getting everything right here. Yeah, I would, I would say the same thing, set boundaries early. Um, 
I think it's like a kind of fall in between <laughs> these two. I don't have children, I'm not married. However, I set the boundaries because I think it's easy for people to look at me and say, oh, well, you don't have kids. So what does that mean? I'm not supposed to have a life, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, set those, set those boundaries. Um, something I do is block my calendar off, you know, and hope people respect it for the most part they do. But, you know, sometimes you need to breathe there like midday. Or if you know you have a project coming up and you don't want to be working until 8 o'clock at night, block off some time on your calendar so that nobody else can put anything there um, so you can make sure that you get it done. But boundaries. <laughs> Um, I echo a lot of what was already said. I think um, work-life balance is not necessarily eight hours a day only and then the rest of the day is yours. It depends on how you want to fill your time, but I think the concept of work-life balance is really dependent on you being organized, you communicating with your manager. Um, that could be, it could depend on your manager, yes. Um, it can depend on the nature of the role that you're doing and the demand that that has. Um, but I think at the, the base of it is, is also your organization. So it's not, oh, I, I'll be out tomorrow. Like, so me doing this panel was on the calendar cleared and it was, if it's not done, it'll, I may log on a little bit later. And that's okay. Cause that still feels balanced and feels like my schedule that I planned for. So I think all of what was said, and then also um, just being as organized as possible and communicating. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. applause for our panelists and our fabulous moderator, Brett. Um, thank you for you know putting your own input in this. I think that always helps when, when our moderators are able to bring themselves um, to that role, too. So it's great to have all of you perspectives. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. We still have um, some time left for our event, so we're going to um, cut the music back on. We want you guys to have snacks. Uh, we do have our photographer, Jared, here uh, from Good Light Media, and he is here to take your photos. So if you would like a professional photo, um, we will get all of the event photos and those uploaded um, in about 24 hours. So you'll get a, a fresh new LinkedIn profile pic um, after you leave this event. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors for tonight's event, so the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore and the Maryland Technology Internship Program make this program possible, um, so we're very grateful to their support. And I have Ava up here with me because we are raffling off either a resume review or a LinkedIn review, so if you have your raffle ticket, she's going to call out a number. The last three numbers are 974. Yeah. So we will work with you to get that set up. Um, and again, thank you all so much for being here with us. We still have a lot of food left. Um, our folks will be around for just a little bit. So if you want to ask them a one on one question, um, now is your chance. So thank you all so much. It's good, good to meet you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I just thank you all for the system. No, it's a D Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 Ye